So welcome to our Everything Marketplaces workshop today, which is going to be on fundraising for marketplace startups, where we'll be covering the basics for raising pre-seed, seed, and Series A rounds specifically. So if this is your first workshop, welcome. And our community workshops are live member events where domain experts walk us through topics that are relevant to us all as marketplace founders and teams here. So they're 20 to 25 minute presentations followed by a group Q&A. So with that said, I'm really excited to welcome on Luba today, who works with startups that are fundraising and also invests in early stage startups herself. So today she's going to walk us through a popular presentation she gives on fundraising, which is going to focus on pre-seed, seed, and Series A rounds specifically. So right before we uh, let Luba take over, though, I do uh, once again want to mention that these are 20 to 25 minute presentations, followed by a group Q&A. So if you do have any questions for the uh, group Q&A, just uh, please post them in the uh, Zoom chat and be sure to uh, turn on your camera so that way I know to uh, call on you when we get to the Q&A part. So with that, uh, thanks again for uh, joining us here today, Luba. And I'm really excited to uh, jump into the workshop. And uh, you know, I'll just uh, let you kind of take over from here and maybe uh, start with a uh, kind of brief intro on your background. Good morning, everyone. I'm Luba Lasiva, and I am the founder of L4C Advisory. We are an investor relations agency that works with early stage tech startups to help them raise money and manage their investors. A little bit about me. Um, <clears throat> besides my day job running L4C, I also run Palumni VC, which is the Palantir Alumni Investing Syndicate and Fund. We invest exclusively in Palantir alumni founders. Before I founded L4C, I ran investor relations at Palantir, where I raised the Series J and the Series K rounds which totaled $1.2 billion over just under 18 months. Prior to that, I invested $200 million in tech startups and VC funds on behalf of Adia. I started my career in Australia, working at Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch, um, and I studied actuarial studies in undergrad. Throughout my career, I've worked in energy, finance, tech in Australia, in Ghana, and in the US, where I now am. A little bit about what we do at L4C. We work with the earliest stages of tech companies to help them craft investor presentations so they can better target, so we can facilitate investor due diligence, and so we can decide when to go ahead and raise money or when to bootstrap. Post fundraising, I tend to get involved on things like uh, investor presentations and board management. Our real focus is on removing the unnecessary friction in fundraising and investor management so that founders can get back to their day job of building products and building companies. The main point of today's presentation is really to give you a very high level of view of the investor landscape if you're building a tech company. What does it look like? Who can you raise money from? What do you need in order to raise money from the types of investors that invest in tech startups? So uh, who better to give us the lay of the land than Jason Lemkin? who likes to phrase it in this way. Angels forget some of the deals they even invested in. Seed can write off any deal. Series A, you can probably afford to make a couple of mistakes. By the time you get to series C, people are genuinely concerned that if their investment in you doesn't work, they're gonna lose their job. And that is a reflected in the risks that they're willing to take. Early stage investors, angels and seed and pre-seed investors are much more comfortable taking on a lot of risk. As you get later stage, they wanna see that company get significantly de-risked and they're gonna be much more focused on your historical metrics than they are on your future potential. Key question that you really need to answer as a founder is do you want to take venture capital money at all? This is a very, very long-term relationship. There isn't really a way to get a VC investor off your cap table you will be stuck with them until the company IPOs, gets acquired or goes under. You also have to keep in mind, the investors are gonna be on your board. They become your boss. Did you start your startup because you wanted to work for yourself? Bringing on investors is kinda of gonna put a spanner in those works. Another thing to keep in mind is that investors have many portfolio companies. If it's a pre-seed fund, it's quite conceivable for that individual to have 10 to 20 relationships just out of that fund. And that doesn't even account for relationships they have from their prior funds. Um, you kind of have one dream, you're all in on this. You're building this to be a unicorn. 
So the VCs are always going to be interested in pushing you to go faster because they don't really care if you go under if it's an early stage startup because they have 19 other companies that they can also push harder. Um, a key thing to keep in mind that you don't have to take venture capital money to build a successful tech startup, not even to build a successful tech unicorn. A little bit more about how long-term that relationship is. This is the uh, time in years to IPO of companies founded in each year. As you can see, it's getting increasingly longer, sorry, of companies going public in each year. Um, you can be stuck with these folks for longer than the average American marriage, which is seven years. So you should be really thinking about it with the same level of seriousness and commitment. I talked earlier about investors having a large portfolio and sort of having 10 to 20 founders that they interact with. Well, why is that? It's because VC returns are so, so skewed. So if we look at this chart, most startup investments don't generate even the money you invested in them. They're just like dead losses. 50 to 60% of deals are just a write-off. They don't even return the money that came in. A very tiny percent, somewhere around 1% of deals generate more than 20 times their money. So what investors want is to have as many shots on goal as possible. They want to have lots of deals so that they have a higher likelihood of getting that 20x, 50x, 100x return. That boils down to VCs want you to be a unicorn. It doesn't make sense for them to invest in you if you think you're going to build a very stable, high margin business that's going to be worth like 200K. That's an exceptional business for you and potentially your descendants to run. That's a great business. It can be a great family business. It can be a great side gig. Um, it's just not something that VCs are interested in. So before you go to market, have us think about what the potential of what you're building is and what you want to do with your life. Do you want to want to work four to six hours a day, have time for family, give something to your kids to inherit and kind of lead a calm life and get a, have a high margin business and fund a nice lifestyle? That's very different to being the CEO of a VC-backed startup, flying all over the world, working 60, 80 hour weeks, being constantly stressed, but yes, ending up on the cover of Forbes. Kind of can't have both, you have to choose. And it's an important decision. And it's really more of a psychological and personal motivation one than a financial one. VCs just don't want the small win. They want the huge unicorn business. Nine out of 10 of their deals will end up being a write-off. That means that the 10th deal has to return not just 10X, so all of the capital that was invested in all the 10 startups of which you're one, but actually kind of has to return 20, 30, 40X because the investors who gave VCs money for the fund are expecting a commensurate return. They didn't give them money just to return one times. They want to see two, three, four, five times for seed fund because they know it's a high risk asset. A little bit about the speed of growth. And I'm sure this is being covered in other webinars, but one of the things you almost have to do if you're building a unicorn is build at hyperscale. Um, and that means always, always being at the very edge of your comfort level. That means out of a given day, out of the 12 hours that you spent at your laptop, you will feel for 10 to 11 hours that you kind of don't know what you're doing and you're winging it. If that is something that is personally very uncomfortable to you and you're very diligent and you're very thorough and you wanna be like 99% sure of something before you do it, you may not be a good fit for building a hyper growth company. Um, but if you are, if that's exhilarating to you, if you wanna be learning every day with every task that you do, hey, I've never hired a designer, but now I need a designer. I need to learn all about that. Let me go do that, hire a designer tomorrow. Um, Hey, I've never sold in Estonia, but uh, now we have lots of customer demand from there. So we have to get a local business license. I've never done that. 
Let me go find out how to do that. If that's exciting to you and you're building in a space where the opportunities to take the entire market before everyone else wakes up and goes, oh, wait, this is valuable, then build that unicorn. Go get external VC funding. Unfortunately, your chances of getting it are slim. I don't say this to be a pessimist. I say this to give you some benchmarks of <clears throat> if you're not having an awful lot of success, if it feels really, really tough, you are not alone and it's probably not even due to you. So these are numbers from Andreessen Horowitz. Um, they got 3000 inbound applications. They didn't even seriously review most of them. They reviewed 200 and they funded 10% of the ones they reviewed. This is pretty similar to most other funds. If you are fundraising, <clears throat> excuse me, you're gonna have to talk to a lot of investors or as one of my former clients calls it, uh, you're gonna have to kiss a lot of frogs to find your Prince Charming. Um, Jeff Bezos talked to 70 investors to raise his Series A for Amazon. Unless you think you're a better founder than Jeff Bezos, get prepared for talking to 60 to 80 investors to get a signed term sheet and money in the bank. I mentioned earlier that you don't need to take VC money in order to be successful. These folks didn't, they're all giant tech companies. They did not take primary venture capital in order to grow their business. You can be successful by funding yourself on customer revenue. But if you've decided you do wanna raise VC money, what does that look like? What do you need to do? First thing you need to do is figure out the numbers that back your business. If you're super early stage and you don't have revenue yet or anything uh, from customers, then really, really understand the size of the space. How big is your total addressable market? How are you gonna target that market? Are you gonna use channel partners? Do you already have inroads there? Can you quantify those inroads that you have? Do you have a waiting list? Get those numbers down and cut them and recut them until you're comfortable saying them forwards and backwards and in your sleep. Have a look at what metrics other companies in your market use. VCs will know them and they will ask them. So calculate those numbers. Next thing is figure out who you wanna target. A really good cheat sheet is find someone who was a version of you 10 to 20 years ago. So for example, if you're building a plugin that healthcare industry is going to use, but it's not gonna operate on a patient it's not going to prescribe medication. It's a plugin and it's a software plugin. Go talk to the investors that invested in ZocDoc 15 years ago and made a lot of money because now they're ready for the next iteration. They're going to be sitting in a meeting with you being like, oh, this sounds a lot like ZocDoc, but now we have mobile and now we have GPS. And like, I made some money on that one. I have a nice lake house in Tahoe now. I could do with another lake house. You know, I'm like kids off to college next year. So try to give them a nice friendly memory of something that rhymes with you. It's not exactly like you, but it's a little bit similar. Start reaching out early. Um, it's super, super easy to just write an email and be like, I know it's too early, however, and then have a good reason. However, I would love to get your advice on per unit versus per user pricing. However, uh, I'd love to make a very informed decision when we are ready to raise. So I wanna give us the longest possible runway to get to know each other. However, I was super impressed with that blog post you wrote about marketplace pricing uh, last month. Um, I thought it was super, super insightful. And if you have just 15 minutes to share, here's my calendar. The other thing that I see founders forgetting to do is lining up references. When a VC gets an inbound email with your name, they don't know who Nicholas is. They don't know who Brandon is. They're gonna go and look to your LinkedIn and they're gonna see who they have in common with you. And the first thing they do before they respond to your email is they're gonna come to someone in person. They can be like, Cynthia, do you know Brandon? LinkedIn tells me you do. What do you think of him? Have you worked with him before? 
So make sure anyone you have in common on LinkedIn with that VC speaks highly of you. If they don't, remove that connection. So at least they're not the top of the pile. Um, also chat to customers, other counterparties in the space, channel partners that will speak highly of you. Tell them you're going to market. Tell them that you might get VCs to chat to them. Get them ready. Don't be madly scrambling to do this at 3 a.m. on a Friday before term sheets are due. Start working on your elevator pitch. Practice with family. Go to your little siblings like high school career day. Start talking about your company and what it does in a very succinct way. Uh, just doing it to your cat is not enough. You really have to do it to other humans uh, and especially to other distracted humans or humans that don't know the lingo. Practice with grandmothers. Practice with people at the checkout at the grocery store. Try and get as many reps as possible in talking about your company. Next time you're on a call with a vendor, like a payroll provider, you're deciding whether to use Gusto or someone else, tell Gusto about your company and listen to yourself. Like, does that sound good? Does that sound natural to me? Am I super nervous saying this word and I always say it wrong? Let's replace it. And then if you need help, if you're finding it all overwhelming, hire help. Not every single person that you hire to help will even be visible to your investors. There's a few key skills. There's really two. Storytelling and spreadsheets. Know your metrics, craft your narrative, practice that elevator pitch. Lots of folks ask me like, hey, I don't know anyone in VC. I sit in Belgrade. I sit in Auckland. I just, I don't know anyone in the space. So the first thing you need to do is try and find someone in common. A former classmate from university, that now works in Silicon Valley, maybe a professor that knows them from some research. Try to find some connection that you have to the VC that you wanna to talk to. One thing you have to decide, and it's a judgment call, is if you really wanna to talk to Sequoia and you found the right partner at Sequoia for your startup because they specialize in marketplaces or because they have a consumer bent, but your better intro is to someone who does enterprise or uh, who only does GovTech, you have to make a judgment call. Do I get the intro to the wrong partner, but it's a good intro? Or do I get the worst intro to the better fit partner? That is a very sensitive judgment call. Whoever you get introduced to, you may get stuck with for the rest of the process. Not all partners wanna share leads. It does vary firm by firm, but it's something to keep in mind. The next thing you need to do is craft a double opt-in introduction. So it's an email that you write. So basically I say something like, hey Dan, I see that you know Fred from Sequoia. I was wondering if you could introduce me to Fred. I have appended a brief description of me and my startup below. I'd really like to talk to Fred at Sequoia because he specializes in marketplaces. And I was very impressed with his recent blog post on building a marketplace from scratch and solving the chicken and egg problem. I like to do like a three stars and then be like, Fred, my name is Luba Lasiva. Link it to your LinkedIn. And I'm the CEO and founder of Company. Directs to the website. We, Company, do elevator pitch. We would like to talk to you, Fred, because of, um, I would really appreciate uh, if, if you're interested in engaging, here's my Calendly. I have a template online um, that I'm sure we could share later that gives you the direct form on how to craft a double opt-in introduction. They're really important. They do three things. One, they make sure that Fred from Sequoia actually wants to talk to you. That Dan didn't just make the intro and now Fred's like, Oh my God, I hate Luba. I have no interest in meeting her. She's now stolen half an hour of my time and I have to talk to her. Um, it's a saving of your time. It's also a saving of Fred's time and it gets you on the right foot with a VC. Um, it makes sure that Dan doesn't talk about my company in a way that's not true or not the best foot forward. Um, it also makes Dan's life really easy because I've given him everything. He literally just goes control F to Fred 
and goes, Fred, this is Luba. I know her from high school. We we're in the same advanced math class. Um, I thought she was super bright then. It looks like she's building something really cool. Would you like to talk to her? He doesn't have to like scrounge around for my LinkedIn. Remember what my company does. I've made it super, super easy for Dan to make that intro. I can then recycle the same bottom bit for other VCs and other introducers in common. It's very important that that introduction mentions why you wanna to talk to that founder. There's lots of VCs. You can be talking to 60 to 80 of them, but every single one of them wants to feel like the prettiest girl at the dance. Make it unique to them. Why are you talking to this individual partner? They're more likely to engage if they feel it's personalized as opposed to a BCC spam list. Also very important, don't burn bridges. Don't be like, oh my God, you're so stupid, Fred, for not wanting to talk to me. Fred goes out to drinks on Friday night with like four other VCs. They're all on Twitter together. They all hang out at the Rosewood. Like they all know each other. They go hiking together. Don't burn bridges. Someone who's not a good fit for this round may be a good fit for the next round. Someone who's not a good fit for the next round is friends with someone who is. You have to be overly nice and polite. It's very strange because VC has this uh, reputation as being cutthroat, but on the surface, it's actually very genteel. Act like you're going to church with your potential in-laws. And then a few tips and tricks. I think we're just about on time. It takes a really long time to close around. Every time you see those TechCrunch articles of like how front closed around in six weeks, hmm. Mathilde Collin knew all the investors that invested in her Series A for two years prior to starting the round. Did she start the round the first day she pitched or did she start it two years ago when she started having coffee with VCs? Be cautious of how journalists like to describe things because a lot of it is clickbait. and It is not a true reflection of the work that went on in the past to make that happen. It is better to raise when you don't need the money. If you are running out of cash, investors can see that. They can see that in the numbers. They can also see it in the desperation in your tone. They're just gonna wanna wait out the clock and get better terms later. It's a pretty rational decision. There's always a competitor to your idea. Do not have a competition slide that has no one else on there. That shows investors that you don't know your own market. Keep in mind that not all advice that you receive from investors is good advice. Sometimes they're just looking for a polite reason to say no. So if they tell you like, oh, you know, Shira, I'm really concerned about your, um, some of your financial forecasting. If I look at the, like the market spend in 2027, it looks a little bit low. I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to get to your TAM with that. They don't really care about your marketing spend in 2027. They're just looking for a polite reason to say no. Don't go and take that advice on board and change your financial forecast. So you're not going to invest. Don't do something for them. Um, and keep in mind that a good VC wants you to have a good pitch. They will do their very best to bring the best out of you. If you feel that that's not happening, um, that probably means they're not a great partner for you, either a bad interpersonal um, fit, or they're just not a great VC. And then a few more tips and tricks. I may leave these on screen and jump through the questions in the chat if that makes sense. Let me see what folks are asking. Yeah, that, that could work. Um, actually, do you, uh, do you just wanna kind of run through these and then uh, we can uh, call sure. on the founders, come on. That'd be yeah. Um, so number one is tell a story in your deck. Humans love storytelling. So craft a beautiful narrative and walk me through it. What is your earned secret? How did you earn it? Why do you think this will be valuable? What's your backstory? I really want to connect with you before I'm going to make a seven to 10 year commitment to be stuck in your cap table. Don't start talking about the company too soon. You definitely do that in, in your intro emails, but in your pitch, you want that beautiful story. Don't send emails from your phone. I know your phone has an email function. Don't use it. 
you may as well just delete it for the period of time that you're fundraising. Autocorrect will strike and you'll get their name wrong and that's really bad. Um, you'll end up misspeaking. It also sounds a little gruff. You accidentally slide into like text mode in the language and it's not polite enough. Remember, you're taking your mother-in-law to church. That's the tone you should be aiming for. Very polite, very genteel. Ask VCs to help. If you're talking to them and they're like, we have a Rolodex of 25,000 potential customers for SaaS businesses. You're like, great. I'd love to chat to three of them this week. See if what they're telling you is really true. And if they're interested in investing, they will do the work. Um, be honest. Don't try and lie about your shortcomings, but do try and make them line up to your fundraise. So if there's a shortfall in your company, be upfront about it. Yes, uh, these, these financial forecasts aren't terribly sophisticated. One of the things we're actually doing with that Series A fundraise is bringing on board a VP of finance. Line up some burn up pitches. In those 70 VCs you talk to will be VCs that you know will not invest. That's fine, you need practice. It's not all that different to sport. You just need to get some runs on the board. Um, keep detailed documentation. Even if it's just emails to yourself, it doesn't need to be some terribly sophisticated product. It can be a Google sheet, it can be emails to yourself, but what firm did you speak to on what day? Which individual did you talk to? Why did you want to talk to them? Like, yeah, you can just say this was a burner pitch or like I wanted to talk to them because they invested in ZocDoc. Um, and then immediate feedback, like get off the call and be like, poor chemistry, she didn't get it. Or exceptional match, they seemed really on board. However, they may have a conflict. Write it down straight away, those are notes for you. What happens is when you're raising the next round, um, you'll have those to look back on. Hey, we chatted uh, when I was raising my seed. It seems you were on board, but you were concerned about a conflict. Wanted to touch base is how's that conflict going? Did you end up making that investment or not? Hey, we chatted when I was raising the pre-seed, you were concerned about the lack of metrics. We now have $100,000 per month in revenue growing at 25% every month. Are you interested in chatting again? Line it up for their last decline. Um, it's also super useful if you do become a unicorn and you end up hiring someone like me in house and I have no idea why those are investors are on the cap table. <laughs> Who is this person? Why are they here? leave those notes in an accessible format. They don't have to be super clean, super neat. But they have to exist in a single place that someone else can draw from them later. Ask VCs about their investment process. It's also a really good icebreaker if you kind of end up with dead time and you want to engage them and they haven't done a good job from their side, like they're just having a bad day. Hey, Brandon, tell me about your investment process. How long does it take you to approve a deal? Hey, Cynthia, I noticed that you have two partners in your VC firm. Um, are you both on the investment committee? How does voting work? Would you want me to meet your co-partner? What's the timeline for that? That's why you need to be a little bit prepared with knowing about their firm and that individual before you get on the call. So you have some of those questions at hand. Um, and then B, on top of whatever is the red flag of the day. It varies. Every month, every quarter, we get a new thing that we're concerned about. Right now, it's probably runway to profitability. Um, you know, like three years ago, it was gap revenue versus sales. Maybe last year it was company culture. Just be aware of what it is uh, and don't trip it. So perhaps this month, it's the don't say things like we're going to scale at all costs, aiming to grow revenue three times month on month, uh, no matter how much it costs. Probably not something VCs are interested in in the month of June. Thanks for uh, sharing with us and running through some of the uh, you know examples and uh, with the uh, tips and tricks. So super helpful. Um, so looks like we have a few questions. Hey, uh, Brandon, do you want to jump on? Cool. So Luba, thanks for doing this. This is actually very timely. I actually started my fundraise process last week 
It's why I have a sore throat, so bear with me. Um, I have a specific question around the one question of, okay, tell me about your raise, um, you know, as far as a price round, a safe round. I wondered if you had any insight of, you know, uh, tripwires there or where, what the investor is looking for um, when they're asking about how you're raising. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then also secondarily, is there any different approach um, speaking to associates versus partners where I've had experiences and just this past week, I've spoken to an associate. I've also spoken to a partner and that the difference in the differences in approaches. And also when you do um, earn that second uh, meeting, obviously I, I'm assuming it's with another partner. Are there different uh, strategies from the other pr uh, previous meetings as well? Um, if you can speak to those couple things. All right, I'll start from the third one. So yes, having a second meeting with the same firm, but another individual is a little bit sensitive because you would think that partner A told partner B about you and why Brandon's an awesome founder and why what he's building is super cool. This may have indeed occurred. Partner B heard this like 20 times last week about 20 different companies. He didn't remember anything. Um, unfortunately, it's his job to remember it, but it's like not feasible. Maybe if it's a super giant fund and he has a personal dedicated chief of staff, then that chief of staff would have printed something out that he would have looked at like immediately before the meeting. But that's highly unlikely. And so what you have to do is find a very polite way to repeat the information without implying that partner B has no memory or partner A is lazy. So you sort of come in with the like, I'm sure you heard all this from your awesome partner A. I'm sure she's told you um, all the relevant details. But I like to start off with just a little bit of a repeat Feel free to cut me off if you've heard this before. I'm Brandon, I run blah, blah, blah. We're building the blah, 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 a little bit about me. I did so and so. And so you give them this very polite rerun. It should be a little bit shorter in the intro. If the, if the initial partner, partner A is not in the room at all, you'll end up running through the deck again and that's fine. If partner A is in the room, like if it's an investment committee, you'll be giving an abridged version. If this is your third and fourth meeting, it's the job of your initial partner to prep you. Hey, I'm taking you to investment committee next Monday. This is what the format looks like. We'll be doing it over Zoom. This is how much time you'll have. This is what is expected of you. This is what other founders have done. If they don't do that, it is perfectly fine to ask. Hey, partner A, I know we got an investment committee on Monday. So I'm wondering if you had time to jump on a quick call, had a few questions around format, layout, expectations. Do you want me to go through the whole deck assuming zero knowledge? Is there a baseline assumption I can make on how much people know about us? So on. Most good firms will keep you updated. They will say things like, we had a meeting uh, last week where we went through our entire investment pipeline and we spent 25 minutes on your company. Um, all of the IC members are already aware of what it does. They're super excited to hear from you on Monday. They will have questions around go to market strategy and team building given your location, whatever it is, right? A good VC should seek to prep you on that, but good VCs also have days, bad days um, and not all VCs are great VCs. So it's perfectly fine to just jump in and ask. So that was question number three. Question number two was around associates. Associates, yes. contrary to belief, do have a lot of power within a firm. And fortunately for you, all of their power is negative. They have the power to kill a deal. They do not have the power to make a deal happen. It is also very important. There are two kinds of associates in a firm or within VC. Some firms don't ever hire analysts. 
So they expect you to graduate college, go work for someone else for two years, get trained in basic finance skills and corporate skills. They'll bring you on board as an associate. You'll have a two-year position and then you basically get kicked out. You're expected to go do an MBA after those two years and it's onto you to like apply and pay for it, whatever else. Those associates, I'm sorry to say, are not terribly useful in your medium term future because they're not going to be principals in two years when you come back to next year to raise your next round. They're going to be a business school. They may be very great to know in the long term because they'll end up as a partner somewhere else in eight years, but it might not be that firm. Or they may end up being a founder. Um, other firms will bring in post MBA associates. Sometimes you'll see that in their title. Sometimes you can just go to their profile on the firm's website and they will say like, Colton completed his MBA at Harvard in 2018. They're like, okay, they're a post MBA associate. Um, so figure out which one they are. Um, be very nice, be very helpful. They do have the power to blow up the deal and just like choose to prioritize other deals that they're working on or not put as much effort into your memo. And then the memo kind of doesn't clear. But they don't, for the most part, have capacity to push a deal through. Um, there are some exceptions. There are some tiny funds which, where it'll be like two partners and one associate. Yeah, okay, that associate has a fair amount of clout. She's one of three people in the room. Um, that's rare. And then what was your first question? In each call, it ultimately ends up, because they tell me about the raise, right? How much are you raising and how are mm -hmm. you raising? There's no instructions or hints of what they want to hear um, versus price store, you know, convertible note or safe. I wanted to know what was the thinking around that question and what are they looking for with those questions? Um, it depends. Sometimes they're just looking for a reason to say no. Sometimes they're like, you know, Brandon was kind of okay. I wasn't terribly excited. And I don't really want to work when he's stirred up. I don't want to do the analysis. And so what they're looking for is for Brandon to say like, we're raising on a 60 million pre-safe. Um, and then they give me like, well, that's too expensive. And I don't have to do the work. And like tech that is out of my inbox. That is not what you want to give them, obviously, right? Um, sometimes they are looking for guidance. If they are a shop that cannot lead around, can only follow, um, then they just want to know what the term sheet already looks like or what your expectations are. Um, I will say what you want to do is keep things as simple as possible and to not negotiate against yourself. I'm kind of against founders giving evaluation. I've never seen it work successfully. Every time I've seen a founder go to market with a fixed number valuation and spell it out, that round has not done well. You let the market decide what the valuation is. Would you say the same about a cap where I'm raising on a valuation cap of X? I would say almost the same, especially if it's your first round. Um, a lot of the time you just wanna go out and test the waters because you could be completely off, right? I've seen deals with very similar companies in the sense of like, all have no revenue, all have like one or two trial customers that aren't paying for it, get done anyway between six and $26 million safe gap. Like that's a big range. And I'm sure if the founder who has a $6 million term sheet had gone to market and said 26, VCs would be like, no, nah, you're kidding, I'm walking away. But on the flip side, if the one that got 26 started with six, they never would have gotten the 26. So you kind of have to let the market decide and it's a little bit coy. You do have to kind of be a little cute about it of like, oh, well, you know, um, I know it's a very volatile in the time in the market. We're really letting the market decide I'm focused on building my product and growing my business. We see valuation as being the VC's job. Now, last year, you could be a little bit arrogant. You're like, we're looking for term sheets by next Wednesday. You can't really say that in today's market. Um, but you kind of leave it predominantly in the VC's um, ballpark.
What they will try and do is if you're a little bit advanced, they'll be like, have you raised before? How much did you raise? What terms were they on? Right? They'll try and create some sort of matrix of, well, it has to be higher than this and more than that. You should have a clear idea of how much you're raising though. I'm raising this much and it's gonna fund this for this law. Awesome, those are really great uh, questions. I'm glad we uh, touched on the evaluation note too. So that comes up uh, regularly in the uh, community. Um, I actually had a question uh, that someone sent me and that was um, in the community earlier. And they were asking about uh, when an investor asked for a data room uh, earlier. So like in a seed round, um, if there's like a, if you have like a checklist or, you know, I would say just like what they're typically looking for. Yeah. Um, so there's actually a very good post um, from Union Square Ventures on why you don't have a data room. It is an arrogant thing. Uh, it certainly worked better last year than this year. There are very sensible reasons to not have a data room. So you can say like, we don't have a data room, but happy to answer any questions or share any documents that you may need. Why? Because it means I have to explicitly ask you for docs. And so when that in itself is a signal, oh, we'd like your cap table. Okay, all right. So you're actually digging into ownership and valuation. That is now like, metadata that I have on, on your process. Um, and then you can also do things like give them a very shallow cap table first. And then you'll be like, no, 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 we wanna see like a more detailed breakdown. Oh, okay, so you're actually like doing work. Um, oh, we'd like to get some founder references. Okay, so you're calling our references, great, I can control that. Um, I can get them prepared. The problem with dumping everything in the data room is it looks efficient for you, right? I'm going to put my deck, I'm going to put my Excel budget or forecast, I'm going to put my references on the founders from just like individuals and customer references on the product, and I'll put a demo video up. Then you have no idea what they're doing. And like, and don't tell me like, oh, I've got it up on Intralinks and I can see when they download it. As soon as you give them access to a data room, they're going to forward it to the associate and be like, download everything. There's no cost to them to doing it. They don't even have to ask you. It's all there in a room. They just come in, take a copy of everything, save it down. And then two years later, you come back and they can cross check. Oh, how'd you do against your forecast then? So you're giving them all of this data without getting any signal on what they're doing and without them actually being interested. That's, and especially like it makes sense if you're raising a series D, series E, series F, like at that point you have a lot of legal doc and you do share data room access, but very far in the process, not for a pre-seed. There's not an awful lot you can put in the data room for a pre-seed. Awesome. That's uh, super helpful. Hey, uh, uh, Borsava, do you want to come on? Yes, thank you. So I'm going to bring you back to the previous question, which you ended uh, with uh, answering with know how much you're fundraising. Uh, so what's your recommendation for that? So we're planning a pre-seed uh, pre uh, this summer and I'm struggling <laughs> and I'm a, I have a finance background, so I shouldn't. But uh, yeah, how much runway, what milestones do you think are appropriate to show for an early stage? marketplace specifically if you yeah so in 2019 i would have said knowing absolutely nothing about your business a really good mm -hmm. guideline is to have 18 months of runway um because you can't really fundraise like 12 months later you just won't get anything done right you'll you'll miss a milestone by a month and suddenly you're screwed or you just won't have enough time um so 18 months and then you always add a 50 percent buffer of like, well, we just didn't get to it. That was my guidance in 2019. My guidance in 2021 was take all the money you can find because <laughs> it's gone cheap. Um, guidance right now, once again, knowing nothing about your business is to line it up closer to that three-year mark. So if you think 18 months was what? 18 plus nine is 27. People are now actually get, get closer to like 36 months of runway. However, the real answer is it depends on what you're building and where you are. So draw a literal like Gantt chart of your company with months at the bottom and think about key risks. You can even start from like IPO and work backwards. Okay, so what are your risks at IPO? Margins, profitability, scalability, uh, key executive hires. 
have I hired a CFO who's IPO before? They go back before that. What's that? Oh, well, like scalability and growth of headcount. Go back before that. And so eventually you end up at a point in the pre-seed and seed, seed stage where you're like, oh, my key risk is maybe like, does the market exist or are the customers willing to pay? Or is it possible to build my product? Like, is my product so technically difficult that actually it's impossible to build? Um, is it possible to hire and board enough people in my demographic, time zone, city, whatever, that will help me build this at the prices that I can afford to pay them? Um, and so you try and line up your fundraise to get you to the next milestone. So to crossing the next risk off, whatever the next risk is for you. And then you add a 50% buffer, right? So you're like, if, if your next risk is building a prototype um, and you think it will take you nine months to build a prototype, then maybe you're like, okay, so what I actually need is 12 months runway. Hey, uh, Monica, do you, you want to come on? I think uh, we have time for one last question. Yeah, sure. Um, it's kind of a combination. Uh, and then you can choose whichever question you want to answer. So I guess uh, when you're talking to VCs in reverse, like I'm like, okay, I need like this much of, like amount for this much runway. But at the same time, I'm only willing to give away like 20%. So in reverse, I set my own valuation, but I don't really want to do that, given your advice. And then the second question is, what's the difference between an investor getting to know you and leading you on or them just keeping their optionality? Like, is this really going somewhere? They're talking to me like every week, every two weeks. And they're like, I'm interested. But like, since the market crashed, like they were like, I need a moment to assess what I actually have. So I was like, oh no, the yes turned into a maybe, but now it's kind of a yes again. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, all right. So on the valuation, I think it's fine to have a range of, I don't want to give away more than X of my company. Um, and that's, that's fine. And it does sort of back into an implied valuation, but if you want, $10 million and you don't want to give away more than a fifth of your company and your company's not worth $50 million. Well, like, guess what? You're just not getting 50. Like something has to give. Either you have to suffer less run rate or you have to give up more dilution. Um, or maybe you can bring the risk factors down. So instead of like, oh, getting us to product market fit, maybe it will be getting us to three customers or getting us to three months of recurring revenue from at least one customer. Something like that, like a smaller signal. Um, on the forcing function, if VCs are still spending time with you, then they're intrinsically interested. Like otherwise it's, it's not worth the opportunity cost of that hour that they're spending with you. Um, what you will find is eventually you need a forcing function to get them to come to the table. That's why you talk to the 70 VCs. Because if conversations are going great with one, but the conversation is not going anywhere, you should be talking to three others and get them to a point where conversations are going great. And you're like, okay, well, we're looking for term sheets. What do we need from you in order to get one? And that comes back to, the, to my answer with Brandon. Ask them about that process. We've now met five times since February. Can you tell me a little bit more about where I stand in the process? What are the next steps from you? Are you looking to cut checks this quarter? Oh, oh, your pin's down until the end of the quarter. Let's touch base in July. Um, if I, I do have a short follow-up question and mm -hmm. only if I have, uh, I'm allowed time, um, is how important do you think FOMO is or momentum is in terms of like when you're actually closing the round, especially given the market conditions now? Yeah, it's less of a driving factor right now. Lots of VCs are like, oh, fine, I'll miss your pre-seed. I'll come back for the seed. Especially if you are so focused on dilution, they can like look at your, your forecast and like, oh, you're buying yourself nine months of runway. Great, you're going to be back in the market in six months. Valuation won't have shifted much. I'll just you know buy it then. Why buy it now? So I think there is... 
the risk of overdoing it on the FOMO right now. Um, but um, I would say last year was a huge, huge driving factor. Awesome. Well, that was a uh, great uh, last question to uh, wrap things up in. Uh, we're, we're out of time here, but uh, this was really great uh, workshop. So thanks, Aluba, for taking the time to uh, you know join us and uh, share all the awesome uh, insights with us here and uh, tips and whatnot. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for the uh, great questions too. Um, so uh, just right before we wrap things up, though, uh, where can we uh, kind of, uh, you know, where can we keep up with you and uh, and reach out to you? If, if uh... Best way to get me is really just email. I'm going to type it in. And, and, I'll, and I'll... you can also follow me on Twitter. Um, and you can search for my name on Substack and you'll get a bunch of very useful posts on how to write double opt-in intros and uh, why VCs want them and uh, like my preferred vendors for early stage tech startups. Here is the specific uh, Substack post on double opt-in intros. Perfect. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take that and I'll uh, include it in the, um, in the details of recording of this. That sounds good. This is, uh, this is really helpful. So, and uh, th thanks all the uh, founders for joining in too. This was fun. Awesome. Glad you guys enjoyed it. <laughs>